everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. We are really excited today to be talking with another author. We love getting a chance to talk to authors on this podcast. And today we have author Terry Ferris here with us, and she is the author of the new book, Since You've Been Gone. And Terry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. So what we like to do is we start out our interviews asking our authors, how did you get started writing? Um, it's not the actual usual tale for most authors. Uh, I actually did not grow up uh, enjoying writing. I didn't enjoy reading actually either. Um, but that was because I had undiagnosed dyslexia and I didn't know. I mean, when I was growing up, it wasn't a huge thing. Um, they just didn't check for it. I mean, people with severe dyslexia, they were starting to do work with, but um, I had learned to compensate for it and me. And so there's a lot of things that they just didn't know to look for. Um, I struggled. Um, I struggled reading in the beginning and then I, I got through that, but it always made me tired. I would often forget what I read. Um, and so reading for fun was just not anything I thought I could understand why people would do. Um, and so when I was actually not until after college, uh, I was put on bed rest for with my oldest son when I was pregnant with him. And this is before Wi-Fi could actually go to your bed. Um, you know, so I was just kind of laying in bed a lot. Uh, and so I started picking up books. Now, I would get very tired. It'd take me a long time to get through a novel. But I had nothing else to do. I just fall asleep when my eyes got tired. And so it actually, though, strengthened my eyes. And I got so I could actually read at a fairly quick rate. Um, meaning that, like, the first time after college, I know I sat down to read a novel. And it took me a month to get through a regular size novel. And so then I was able to get through it in a few days, which is much more reasonable. <laughs> and so as I strengthened my eyes, I just fell in love with because I'd always loved story. I mean, I always loved movies because I loved story. And I loved how much more you got out of a book than you did a movie. And how the library was just full of all sorts of stories that I could also dive into where I hadn't really explored that growing up. And so my friends who all loved reading just thought it was hilarious. So I'm like, oh my word, they're everywhere. And these, are, these stories are amazing. Have you read this? And, and um, one night when... I had pretty much read everything in my house. And again, this is before you could actually download um, stories into, you know, your right now you just put another one on your phone if you ran out of things to read. But back then you had to go to the library. And so I ran out of books. And so I sat down and just started writing my own story, mainly because I had been making up stories in my head since I was young. Even though I didn't necessarily like reading, I loved creating story in my head. And so I kind of merged this new love of reading with the stories I created in my head. And um, so, yeah, it was super fun to do. Of course, that first story I wrote, um, I wrote myself into a corner. <laughs> and so I started a new book and completed that one. And I took it to a writer's conference. And then I sat down and realized I really didn't know how to write a book. So um, my characters just kind of went through life and things happened to them, but there was no role plot or <laughs> goals. And so I took a bunch of classes through my book therapy and Susan May Warren. And now, I mean, that's been about eight, nine years ago. And so I just dove into the classes and that's kind of where I ended up uh, starting to write. I was really excited to read that on your website that you described yourself as a math loving dyslexic girl. Because it's something I can relate to, because uh, I had some dyslexia, and, and I was a late reader. I didn't start reading until, like, I don't know, whatever third grade is, mm -hmm. uh, second, third grade, something like that. And, uh, and but then once I, once I got into it, then I, you know, became really excited about it. And, but really, I, I wouldn't say I was a voracious reader until until I was older, like you were saying. Uh, I don't re remember reading a lot uh, when I was in high school. There were s some books that I liked, but I it wasn't until I was older. I don't know. I felt like something kind of clicked when I was in college that all of a sudden things that weren't, that were, had been so hard for me for a long time weren't as hard. There was like something that changed in my brain, I think. And, uh, and uh, so I definitely related to what you were saying. I'm not the math part cause I, I'm, I'm not good at that, but, but the, but the 
struggle reading. I, I could relate to that actually quite a bit. Yeah, I do think that my, the reason uh, my love of math and I was very good at math uh, actually led to them not really like the fact that I was not that good at reading and spelling. Um, people just kind of dismissed it and said, well, it's OK, you're really good at math. <laughs> and so nobody actually ever challenged me. And we're like, you know, you can become a good reader. You can do these things. They were like, well, you have other strengths. Don't worry about it. And so in some ways, it I mean, it was good. I mean, I loved math, but in other ways, it kind of held me back of ever growing and reading for a long time because people just saw it as a either or not. I can do both. Well, and it's so interesting because I had what's called a strabismus in my eyes where I would, it, my, my alignment wasn't correct with how I would focus on things. And my vision was very good. So like when I would do the vision tests, I would do well, but the focusing sometimes my I would start to wander. I would I would have a tr really hard time with um uh, with uh, um depth perception. You know, like I I can't do anything like tennis and stuff like hand eye cord terrible. It was hard for me to learn how to drive. Things like that uh, were struggles. Uh, but they they I guess didn't really think they could do anything about it until I was older and I, and I was able to get surgery to help with the strabismus twice. Uh, and, uh, and, but all of that kind of impacted my ability to, to read because hmm. you, know, you just have to That's... be able to focus when you read. Right. That's why I listen to a lot of audio books. Yeah, I do enjoy uh, is, that. Is well. one of my favorites. Yeah. So anyway, this is very, very interesting. Uh, do you feel like the pandemic has made it easier or harder to write? Um, actually harder. I would think originally I was hoping it'd be easier because I would just have less on my plate. But two things it also did was because I had less on my plate, I was less careful about my time. And so I wasn't, you know, so careful to say, okay, I have two hours right now. I need to sit down and write. I'd say, well, I have some time today. I need to. And that's much harder harder for me to be disciplined when I have an open-ended. Um, the other thing that got complicated is we don't live in a very large house. We have five of us and we, our house is about 1800 square feet. Um, and so it's not, I mean, it's plenty big enough for us. Uh, my boys share a room, but there's not a whole lot of places to go to be alone. And so I actually, we have a, a walk-in closet that I actually put a chair in just to get an extra space because my husband was working out of our, our room. We both have our desks in our bedroom. So our bedroom suddenly became our bedroom and our both of our offices. Our kids were home, so they were in different rooms trying to get their schoolwork done. And so trying to find some quiet and long sections of uninterrupted quiet where I could just dive into my story um, was much more challenging than I had anticipated when it first shut down. I was like, Oh, I'll get so much writing done. And then I was like, this yeah. isn't happening. That makes sense. <laughs> like, leave me alone. Yes. <laughs> Be in my closet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what drew you to contemporary Christian romance as your genre of choice? Um, I really fell in love with, I used to always read historicals, but I really re fell in love with um, the contemporary romance and Robin Jones Gunn's, um, her Glenn Brooks series. And I loved how her characters were so kind of, it was just the fun, the kind of people that you felt like you should, wanted you were friends with. I remember when I finished the series for the next few days, I kept feeling like I needed to call somebody. Like, there's somebody I need to call. There's a friend I need to. And I realized it was just, I felt like I hadn't connected with these friends that I had. And I thought, that's the kind of books I want to write. I want to write those friends that you put the book down and you feel like you know them so well. You The next day, you want to call them to find out what's going on. And that really, uh, and then I also was very influenced by a lot of Susan A. Warren's books, um, a lot of her Deep Haven books. Um, I just love the, the interconnectedness of the characters, the real characters. And I know you can do that with historical. Um, I just felt, I guess, I don't know. I just felt like I was able to best communicate with the contemporary romance. Mm, cool. Yeah, Robin Jones, again, she, uh, I got a chance to interview her. She's a, a really neat lady. So yeah, she great. is. Uh, would you describe yourself as a pantser or a plotter? 
I am a plotter for the book, but I am a panster generally for the scenes. So I, I know like in this scene, I know I want this to happen, but what that will look like a lot of times will really change. Like I just start writing and who knows what's going to you know, happen or sometimes characters will show up in scenes that I hadn't planned on them showing up in. And all of a sudden I have to figure out why they're there or, you know, that's actually in my very first book, um, the pastor, Nate, he just showed up one day when I was writing a scene and then I was like, oh, I'm so intrigued by him. And I ended up weaving him into the rest of the novel. But so I, I am a plotter where I tend to know the big pieces of the story because I wanted to, but then, um, but then I kind of, each scene is always a surprise to me, kind of. Do you have to sort of develop strategies to help you in your writing with your dyslexia? Do you, do you have sort of a different, maybe different strategy than maybe other authors do in order to stay focused? Um, I, I'm trying to think of that. What is, it's hard to know exactly what, you know, how other authors do it. But I do, uh, one thing I, I mean, I, I am, I'm well aware with my dyslexia that my first drafts are ugly. <laughs> they are very ugly because I mean, they have, um, they have sometimes wrong words, uh, especially because Scrivener, which is a, a, a program used to write novels a lot of times now has chosen a new autocorrect function, which I didn't realize in my last novel when I was right, typing. And I actually, um, sometimes when I'm typing, I will flip around letters or different, you know, like switch two letters when I'm typing really fast. I don't realize it. And I can't try to catch as much as I can on my edits, but I realized I sent it to, off to my editor. And uh, I said that um, one of the characters I said, he sent, an e he sent her the heroine email across the table, which doesn't make sense at all. It was supposed to be smile that he sent her a smile across the table, which made sense. <laughs> but it had changed it. And she just highlighted it and was like, I have no idea why he would do this. <laughs> no, he's not going to pull out his phone and send her an email. So I've, I, one thing I do, is I definitely communicate. I, I, I communicate with my people all around me. I recognize this is a weakness of mine. Do not feel like, I do not feel judged when you correct what I do. You know what I mean? Like, this is strong. This is the wrong word. This is, you know. And I always tell people, make sure you proof anything that I do because I could drop a letter and I would never see it. Even if I know how to spell the word, like I could always just drop a letter and I won't know. And um, so those kind of things. I just mainly try to be most honest and transparent to those who are closest in my circle where I can, I need their help. You know, I'm very transparent with my editors. I'm very transparent with my um my my early readers, my friends, the people I work with, you know. That's good. It takes a little humility, but uh, that that's very good. I We'd like to take a second from this episode of the podcast to celebrate our sponsor of this episode, and that is the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcast? Do you want an inside scoop into what happens on the podcast? Do you want early access to episodes and loads of cool perks? Now is the time to become a patron of Hallmarkies Podcast. By becoming a patron, you get to access our patron Facebook group. You can request episodes or even be a guest on the podcast. And most importantly, any patron can join our monthly movie watch-alongs with stars like Paul Campbell, Natalie Hall, and more. It's as low as $2 a month to join in and become a special part of the Hallmarkies family please consider, and we will love you forever. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Right, well, let's talk about, since you've been gone, your new book. Congratulations. That's very Thank exciting. you very much. <laughs> uh, and why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what the book is about? Yeah. So the series Restoring Heritage uh, is about a fictional town in um, west side of Michigan, so kind of over by Lake Michigan, not right up next to it, um, about 10 minutes inland. And over the series, um, the, the small town that's kind of gotten run down uh, has 
slowly started to restore. So the first book, they won a contest to bring money into the town. And the second um, book, they were um, building up the town square, so putting some funds into that. And so the third book is really showing the businesses coming back to um, heritage. So it kind of uh, brings full circle um, the, the idea of restoring the town. And so uh, I actually released a prequel novella before it, to introduce the series, and it had a small business shutting down. So by uh, two characters, Leah and Caroline Williams, and we've met, seen them again a few times in the series, but Leah is now coming back, and she is re wants to reopen her same small business. And But in order to do so, she has to work with uh, John Kensington, who has inherited the um, Kensington fortune and who's finally now also returned and needs to deal with a lot of the problems his uncle has caused after his father's uh, death. And his father died right before book one started. And so there's been a lot of problems in book one and book two from John's uncle. So now John is coming home to deal with a lot of those problems. And now he has to work with uh, Leah and she's trying to open a small business in town. Yeah, and well, and you actually have two love stories in this book with Madison and Colby and John and Leah. Yes. Yes. And so I was wondering if that was difficult to sort of balance both stories and make sure they're both kind of taken care of. Yes and no. Um, all three of my full length novels of the series, I've done that. I've had a uh, main romance and then a subplot romance um, that weave together and often um, have, you know, they kind of play out and have, they both have other different issues, but they kind of, it, their paths keep crossing. And it, the first book, it just fit because uh, the romance was between um, Hannah and Luke, but then her brother and Hannah's best friend also had a romance. So it worked. So I just decided to do that in the other two as well to kind of give a, kind of a cohesiveness to the series. Um, so I've gotten kind of used to, you know, kind of the subplot, running them back and forth. The biggest challenge with this particular one was that uh, Madison doesn't really want to do much outside of her house. So trying to keep their plot moving when she doesn't want to interact with the town very much, especially in the beginning, was a challenge. Um, and... I think the biggest challenge I found in doing this is less about handling their plots as much as how many people it now has pulled into the series. So um, people like to have your characters revisited, but so I have two other novels and two other novellas that come before this book. So I'm trying to occasionally allow, uh, so that would be two, four, six, Couple, six, yeah, two, four, six other couples to occasionally show up in this novel to so that readers feel like, oh yeah, I remember them. You know, they're from the other novel mm -hmm. to kind of give that small town feel. But that's a lot of people to keep track of, especially knowing that there's going to be some people who have never read, that haven't read the first two books. So trying to make it clear who people are without feeling like you're retelling their stories and yet not feel like you're throwing too many characters at your reader, but at the same time for your faithful readers, they want to receive these characters. That was the bigger challenge I always had is balancing those two. Yeah. I can imagine that would be tough. Uh, especially when you already have two, two main stories to begin with, and then you've got all the, the rest. Uh, so you have, I think, Madison going on the biggest faith journey, I would say, of the book. Um, as a Christian writer, is that tough to kind of to add those themes in without it being heavy handed? It is. Um, so I try I try to. I try to let the character tell the story in order I try to never come at a character with an agenda. And my goal is not to get you to a certain place, but I want to walk through this with you and try to really decide how this character would generally respond. Um, so for some of my, you know, characters, I don't, I want 
my readers to be able to identify with at least one of my characters. And so that as they grow, they can see, they can see areas of their own life, maybe that they can choose to grow in. Um, that was a challenge where Madison actually comes to faith right before the story, but it's a really, uh, she doesn't really under, have a strong, I would say, understanding of her faith. And so that's probably a lot of that is that growth and, in her, but it is, it is, it's a challenge because I want to be true to somebody at that stage and not put my own agenda in it. But I also want it to be clear where she's walking. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. And you want to uh, portray it in a, in a way that's true to the story without it feeling like a ministry. You know? Yes. I I wanted to feel I wanted to feel like the character is telling a story, but the author is not trying to tell a key story through the character. And mm, so yeah. which I know is essentially is, is essentially true, right? I am telling the story, but at the same time I wanted to feel like it's not agenda driven. I'm not doing this to make a point. I'm mm. just want to tell the story, her story. Let her explain her journey and hopefully in her journey somebody could connect with that. Yeah. So with John and Leah, you have a second chance romance. And I always figured those must be kind of challenging to write because you don't want the characters to feel like petty, you know, like, oh, I've got this grudge against you for whatever reason, but they kind of do. That's why they fell out of favor. But then you have to still keep them likable. Is that tough? Um, It is. Um. It is hard to make your characters first angry with each other without making them unlikable. Yeah. Uh, I especially dealt with that last book because everybody loved the pastor Nate, but you know, my main hero in the second book comes on the page hating Nate is his brother. They're very much in conflict. And people were like, ha, ah, you know, it's it's always a challenge. But you why I think you when you set them in a in a sympathetic situation and really able to tell their position um to somebody you know and i tried to in one of the early scenes with uh leah when she's explaining some of her frustrations with john have her friend point out the fact that a lot of this is childish and you need to let it go so that the reader could say yeah it is childish and you need you know like not feel like and have leah because i know there are times we all hold on to things that are childish it's human nature right we're not going to all be just make the best choices So then I, once I kind of said, okay, these are their past issues and where it planted seeds of doubt in her, but she's got other, you know, deeper issues, more really to do with her parents than really anything to do with John. And so I try to pull that out and showing that having a character pretty much call her on some of the pettiness of the past, but at the same time, showing how it can plant seeds of that connect to other Um, really wounds she has in her life and so that that when they come up again it's not really connected as much to high school pettiness as really deep wounds that her parents left Mm, yeah yeah that was good uh so with madison uh it was kind of edgy i thought for a christian contemporary romance to have her be pregnant not knowing the father considering at one point terminating the pregnancy but then she come you know she has her conversion um i i did you get any pushback at all on that from no me? i actually yeah. haven't and in fact everybody who's read it so far really says that madison's one of their favorite characters of all times in all of heritage and all of heritage and which everybody thinks yeah. is so ironic because everybody hated her in the first book and uh-huh. Uh, yeah, she's in the yeah she's in the first book, and everybody hated her because you see her from other people's point of views, and you do understand why there's such a pushback of Colby's reaction, of uh, Olivia and Janie's reaction, because you know her from the first book. But oh, I thought um, she was new to town. Yeah, well, yeah, she's that's coming back to, me. to town like... because her father died. Oh, oh, yeah. right, right. And so she, in the first, she's engaged to Thomas in the opening of the first book, mm. and so. Um, she's around for about half of the first book and um, she's just, 
it was it was edgy. Actually, the idea came about because I was talking with somebody uh, I knew from my past in a, a small town, and I was very, I mean, from who I knew them to be in high school and to who they are now, they had changed a lot. Mm-hmm. And I knew my when they reaction, they're like, "Yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm now involved with my church, and I do all these things." And I knew my reaction was like more shocked than it should have been because right because jesus is all about you know that's what he's about he's about redemption he's about these and we believe it happens and i see it all the time here in phoenix right all my a lot of my friends at churches have what i would consider rough backgrounds but when you've lived that with somebody when you kind of walked that in a small town with them it feels more shocking like oh you know, you could love Jesus, which should not be shocking. That is what it's all about. And so when I had that conversation, I kind of was almost chastising myself, like, why would that be so shocking to me? That's what, you know, Christ is all about. He's about um, reaching in and healing the broken. And I was like, that is Madison. I think, I think she's got so much to her story that, and it would be, and it is hard for a town, I think, to accept. Honestly, I think what is more challenging than even her edgy background is the fact that we see, you know, Nate and Olivia and these people, we, we, we respect their faith journey from their books, right? We know who they are. And yet we can say, why aren't you being nicer to her? You're supposed to be a Christian. And the reality is that small town. And that's what I think we are, we need to be challenged on and not just our perceptions of necessarily a rough background, but accepting fully accepting mm-hmm. people and they're changed and giving people a second chance. Yeah. You know, the healthy have no need of a physician. Right. right. Absolutely. Right. Very, very good. That's good. Uh, so how did you come up with the whole idea of the Wi-Fi? That um, actually came up when I was doing my um, PS goodbye, my novella, um, which is uh I just, again, I I gave it away at part of my uh, newsletter giveaway um, so that I could, uh, was as a new author, was trying to get my name out there before my first book to kind of expand my reach a little bit. So that's why I wrote the novella. And I came up with Wi-Fi um, initially there because I just wanted something quirky and funny and that likable, but funny. So there's not very many options. So I, I just like the idea that it kind of fit how heritage is um, out of date um, at the time, right? So in the PS Goodbye, it fit because they were, um, they were needing to be restored because so much of them was part of the past, right? They needed to bring it into the and that was the name of the store. It didn't work in contemporary times because people thought it was a computer store. And so um, they were always having to explain why it was called the Wi-Fi. And so when I, I liked how I bring that back in where Leah is determined to keep the name, but part of it is she needs to let go of her past and she needs to embrace her, you know, where God's taking her in the future. And so it kind of was ended up being very symbolic of just kind of letting go of things that didn't work and now embracing something that will. Yeah. Yeah. If people don't know, the Wi-Fi is the name of Leah's store that her family has had in the Because uh, it stands for, uh, it used to be a uh, like a general store. And so her grandfather had named it because it stood for want to find it. And so it's that idea that it contained a little bit of everything. So it worked back in the day before there was such a thing as internet, but now it just was more humorous. Right. Yeah. Uh, So for your Restoring Heritage series, I'd say, I think the next one that you should do, you probably already have it done, but I think Sister (laughs) Abby is the... Yes, I do. going off to Europe. She's going to... (laughs) Yes, I do. Abby is definitely going to get a story. Also, um, it was hinted at in this book, but not actually. And it's been hinted at in my Christmas novella. And that is uh, Ellie, which is Gideon and Janie and Olivia's younger sister. Uh, We'll have a story with Cade, who is the artist. And it kind of hinted at that a tiny, tiny bit um, when he asks about Ellie. Um, But 
part of those, I feel like I need to get away from my heritage a little bit. They all need to grow up a little bit. Um, and then once they, they get a little older, grown up, I will be ready to uh, take them through. Because part of it, part of their issues are their immaturity and they're young. And so I feel like to give them a little time, a little chance to grow up, and then I'll return. I've even thought about someday, you know, with the, especially dealing with a lot of the other uh, Matthew siblings, because I think there's seven siblings, and the youngest one's six or seven by the last book. Yeah. So, you know. Could have Abby meet some handsome tour guide in (laughs) in Italy or something like that? All sorts of things. Yeah. It would be great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're excited about the book. We'll have a link if people want to check out our affiliate link. People can get the uh, purchase the book. Uh, but before we go, we have some fun, silly questions we like to ask our guests. So awesome! All right, here we go. First one: What is the best ice cream flavor? Ooh, I love uh, chocolate silk, like a little creamy, creamy oh, chocolate. Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite color? A pale, pale, pale blue, real icy pale oh, blue. Good. Uh, what music are you into? Um, I like almost anything that can make me dance or move around. So uh-huh. if it has a good rhythm and it's catchy. I probably like it. There you go. All right. What is your go-to date night food? Uh, Mexican. Ah, oh, okay, good. And back when we can go on activities and dates, what is your go-to date night activity? Go out and do. Um, actually, probably more than anything, my husband and my date night in, where we tell the kids they're on their own for dinner, and then we just go into our room and put on. We'll pull a, a, a movie up on my computer and just have some yeah. date night in, just because of. There you go. You were ready for COVID. You're ready right. for COVID we were. dates already. We were because with between babies cost of babysitting and all this, we were not we we have a tight budget, so it was we often did date night in. That's good. All right, dogs or cats? Dogs. Okay, beaches or mountains? Mountains. Would you rather be in a fancy dress or sweats? Ooh, that's really tough because I love getting dressed up, but then I love putting on the sweats afterwards. So yeah, probably depends what color the dress was. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we all are sort of moving to team fancy dress because we're just tired of being at home in sweats. Yeah, I do yeah. love like I have a lot of gala dresses from different writers conferences. I love to get a fancy dress and all oh, fancy up. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. all right, what is your favorite holiday to celebrate? Christmas. It's hard to be Christmas because Christmas is a whole yeah. season, you know, like it where is. every other holiday is just a day or maybe a week. Christmas is yeah, you get a whole... in the world of Hallmark. It's like four months. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question. What is your favorite Hallmark or romantic movie? Uh, probably my favorite. Can't think of which Hallmark. I, there's a few that stand out, but I honestly I can't I remember the titles of. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, favorite probably classic romantic movie is uh, I can never be Pride and Prejudice. It's, I know mm-hmm. it's a classic, yeah. but I love almost every version of it. Yeah, I will say yes to. Mm-hmm. Very good. All right, you passed the test. <laughs> you answered all the <laughs> questions. <laughs> Yay! But, uh, thank you so much for coming on to talk with us. Congratulations on the book. That's a huge accomplishment. And, thank you uh, very much. Yeah. Uh, so when does it become available? Uh, uh, September 7th. Great. Very good. Well, do you have social media or anything like that you want to share? Uh, absolutely. You can always find me on terryferris.com. Or, and then... There has all the links to wherever I am on social media. Great. You can find that on my website. 
great. We'll have that in the description. Make sure you all check it out. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes, and on Goodreads if you want to check out my book thoughts. And then also uh, make sure you're all following the podcast at Hallmarkies Pod and Hallmarkies Podcast, all of our social media. If you are listening on iTunes, please leave us your ratings and reviews. We really appreciate that. And if you are listening on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have our merch store and patron group. So please take a look at all that information in the description. And thank you so much, Terry. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy. Yeah. We'll have to talk to you in in the next book. (laughs) Sounds great. Bye, everyone.